Goldie. Okay, I think I should just uh, continue. We have two more speakers before the short coffee break. And after the coffee break, we're going to have a little panel discussion. So after the coffee break, I'd like to invite all the speakers, even from yesterday, just to come in the front. And then, uh, yeah, we can have a discussion here. So the next speaker is uh, Andreas from GRNet. Ah, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this um, this presentation is about the design and the procurement of uh, the new uh, GRNet Layer 2 and Layer 3 network, which is called uh, GRNet 4. Uh, this presentation is not supposed to be very technical. Uh, the thing that uh, I want to present is mainly uh, the design principle uh, and uh, decisions that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the design principle and deci uh, decisions that. Okay, better. Uh, and, uh, and we took the approach and the methodologies uh, uh, that uh, we followed, the, the lessons that we learned, and the uh, experience that uh, we gained. And uh, also, this presentation is not about uh, uh, the procurement of our uh, fiber and uh, the WDM network that uh, will uh, follow. So let's start with uh, the footprint. Uh, GRNet uh, currently owns more than uh, 9,000 kilometers of uh, uh, dark uh, uh, fiber. Uh, most of the network is uh, the WDM, uh, but there are some small uh, parts that you see in, in uh, black that uh, are lit with uh, plain Ethernet switches and uh, one gigabit uh, uh, links. Uh, GRNet have, uh, has uh, pops uh, all over Greece. Uh, the smaller pops uh, just host uh, an Ethernet switch. The larger, the larger, the medium, and the large <coughs> pops uh, host uh, our IP routers. GRNet also operates uh, two data centers, and there's uh, a, bat a bunch of uh, servers also in a third location. This doesn't really qualify as a data center. And we plan to uh, install uh, a new one uh, within 2013. So, uh, why upgrade at uh, the first place? Well, uh, one good reason is that uh, the old hardware doesn't support uh, new features. Uh, our large, our old, uh, our previous uh, big uh, uh, procurement happened uh, eight uh, or nine years ago. Uh, <coughs> this equipment, uh, some of this equipment is already end of life or uh, reaching end of life. And uh, a lot of uh, new cool features are not, uh, are not supported there. So, if we cannot uh, give uh, uh, new services, then uh, we, uh, we have no reason of existence. Uh, we need to, be to differentiate from commercial ISPs in order to make sense to, to exist. And uh, we are not uh, able to secure any funding if we do not uh, uh, provide new services uh, or uh, participate in uh, the other uh, EU uh, projects. And of course, there is no funding if you have no, no new features. Uh, another reason to upgrade is the cost of uh, 10 gigabit ports. Uh, on the old equipment, the cost is uh, uh, so big that uh, it makes better sense to replace it rather than uh, upgrade it. And there's no 100G support. Uh, another issue with our, our network is, that is the uh, heterogeneity of the network. Uh, as I told you, the, the last big uh, procurement happened uh, uh, eight or nine years ago. And uh, after that, we had uh, some uh, small uh, incremental uh, upgrades. And this resulted in having uh, two different uh, router vendors and uh, three different uh, switches vendor. And uh, each of these uh, vendors have, uh, have several platforms on uh, our network. Uh, so it is very difficult uh, at the end of the day to manage uh, this uh, kind of network. We have a lot of uh, problems with uh, interoperability. And uh, of course, uh, the feature. Okay, probably I should turn off wireless. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, and another problem is, uh, is the, the feature uh, parity. Uh, different uh, equipment supports different features. 
So either we have to go with a minimum uh, common denominator of features or uh, support different uh, services on different uh, regions of our network. Uh, this uh, results in uh, an increased uh, uh, OPEX and uh, it makes difficult or even impossible to deploy new services such as uh, bandwidth on demand. And uh, last but not, not least, we want to get rid of uh, Ethernet as a one uh, transport technology. We have a uh, huge uh, uh, problems with a uh, spanning tree, especially in a multi-vendor environment. Uh, it is very hard to monitor and troubleshoot uh, problems uh, on uh, pure Ethernet. Uh, we have sca scalability issues and uh, all these things means uh, downtime and increase uh, uh, operational uh, cost. Andreas. Yes. A quick, uh, quick question to clarify on that. So, um, so it wasn't just Ethernet as a point-to-point -point technology. You had a large layer two LAN. Uh, actually, if you see the topology here, yeah. you see that there are a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, rings. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, the rings are uh, artificially blocked by putting a router there. Uh, here, for example, there is a ring. So here, this is a switch. So we have a ring here, and this is for resilience. Uh, but this, uh, this, uh, this means that we need to run uh, spanning tree here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the same thing. Basically, uh, the if we didn't have spanning tree, the topology would be quite different. Now we have uh, put uh, routers here in purpose so as to not to, to have so much uh, a need for spanning tree. Or you could uh, switch off spanning tree and use something else for resilience, for example, any read based uh, detection switch. Uh, well, uh, the problem is that uh, we have uh, a lot of different vendors. So okay. it is uh, each vendor has a different approach. Uh, it, it is very hard to, uh, uh, to, deal, to deal with this. So uh, we have taken a lot of uh, uh, a lot of time in trying to uh, put the uh, same uh, same vendor, the same vendor in the, in the same area. So, for example, here we have only extreme. Uh, we have tried to. I mentioned it here, but I didn't say much. We tried uh, to deal uh, with this uh, with uh, MST, which was supposed to to do the job, but uh, we ran into many problems. Uh, Juniper and Extreme has very uh, poor implementation uh, of MST and interoperability was a uh, hell uh, anyway. So at the end of the day we uh, went that we ended up with uh, just a rapid spanning tree and this is why we put uh, routers everywhere so that we will not have to. But this is not the only problem of, of Ethernet. The other big problem is that we couldn't monitor the services. So we had a VLAN but uh, if there was a problem somewhere uh, we, d we wouldn't know. So we need something like uh, OAM. So, uh, in order to prepare, design, and uh, procure, we decided to set up uh, a small team uh, of uh, six uh, people. Uh, this team started uh, preparing uh, for the upgrade about uh, one and a half year ago. Uh, the first step would be was to gather the requirements, uh, do the dimensioning of the network, um, examine uh, the various uh, alternatives uh, with regard to technologies and apologies, mm. and uh, at the end uh, decide uh, about uh, which uh, is the best uh, uh, technology, uh, make a draft uh, uh, design, and uh, present to the to the management. Uh, after uh, after the draft design was approved by the management, uh, we proceed with a uh, more detailed design and uh, the procurement. Uh, an important parameter here is that uh, the lifespan of GNET4 is uh, at least five years. We expect uh, we expected uh, it to be there most probably by to, uh, 2020. Uh, however, the situation in Greece uh, makes this uh, makes uh, this uh, lifespan. Uh, makes possible that this life uh, span will be increased. So, starting with the services that uh, our new network was supposed to deliver, uh, the most uh, important uh, 
and popular service, of course, is uh, internet connectivity. So our customers connect with uh, BGP. Uh, we give uh, IPv4 and, IPv and IPv6 unicast and multicast uh, uh, feeds. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, features and protocols that uh, are necessary here. So we had to examine uh, which new protocols and which new functionality uh, we need. For example, I mentioned here uh, router PKI or uh, firewalling services, uh, IPS, IDS, and uh, uh, such things. Uh, the other thing that we wanted from our new network is to uh, keep on uh, uh, providing a, a layer to uh, VPN uh, services, Ethernet uh, VPN services. Uh, our customers uh, make uh, big use of such services in order to connect uh, their uh, own sites or co connect to another customer or uh, even connect uh, to our data centers. Uh, in, uh, in our current network, we, we do not have um, any request for layer 3 VPNs. Uh, for some reasons, uh, the users do not uh, find this uh, service interesting. And actually, we have uh, decommissioned the service a couple of years ago. And we have a very sparse uh, QS request, mainly because there is enough capacity on the network. But however, it would be cool if our new network would support uh, these features in, uh, in case we, we need them in the future. Um, keeping uh, those uh, in mind, we designed the... Um, uh, we proceeded the design of the new, new network. We, we took um, a service-oriented approach and we decided uh, to separate um, the IP network, the carrier network, the access network, and uh, uh, the data centers. So each uh, piece of equipment would uh, belong to a specific uh, part of uh, this architecture and would have uh, very specific uh, uh, roles and functions. This is uh, different from the approach that we had before, where uh, all the routers, uh, uh, in our network would play uh, all, uh, all of the roles. Um, an important uh, aspect of the preparation is dimensioning. So before uh, going any further, we had to answer some questions, like uh, what is uh, the capacity, the, the projected uh, capacity needs for the customers, the, uh, the projected um, capacity needs for our backbone links, uh, how many IP uh, pops uh, do we need? Uh, where should we place them, them uh, etc. One question also is uh, if uh, we need uh, 40 gigs or uh, 100 gigs at some point. So we performed some uh, traffic analysis and uh, projections and we got some uh, interesting uh, results. First of all, uh, uh, right now uh, there's no immediate need for uh, for more than uh, 10 gigs. Uh, most of uh, our customers um, will remain uh, at 1 gigs. We already have a few customers that are connected at uh, 10 gigs. A few more might join. A few might need to upgrade to uh, multiple uh, 10 gigs. But uh, we do not see an immediate uh, or a mid-term need for 100 gigs there. Uh, the, backbone, uh, the backbone will also be uh, uh, we'll also use 10 gigabps links. Uh, this is uh, over engineering in most cases. Uh, the core of the network, though, we might in the core of the network we might need uh, um, multiple of uh, 10 gigs. Uh, the ZAND and the IX uh, traffic uh, uh, will not increase that much uh, by 2015. Uh, we expect that uh, it will be less than uh, 20 gigs. So. We do not need uh, immediately uh, any 100, 100 <coughs> gig interfaces, but uh, maybe after uh, 2015, uh, it will start making sense to uh, to have such uh, ports. So we do not uh, we do not include any 100 gig uh, ports uh, uh, on the initial procurement, but uh, we wanted to uh, our network to be uh, ready for 100 gig. Uh, another interesting. Um, uh, result of the uh, traffic analysis uh, was uh, about the location of the IP pops. So we found out that 93% uh, of our traffic uh, has uh, one, one uh, endpoint in uh, Athens. Uh, based on this number, we decided uh, that it makes a lot of sense to keep uh, 
to, to have uh, our IP pops uh, only in Athens. There is very few traffic uh, that uh, uh, with the um, there's very f very few amount of traffic that uh, uh, would be switched uh, locally, and uh, <coughs> even in this case, uh, the propagation delay in our network is not that big. Uh, Thessaloniki, wi which is uh, the second big uh, city in Greece, in the north of the country, was also um, uh, an option. Uh, mainly because we could use it as, as a second uh, exit uh, point, but we decided not to not to put an IP pop uh, there at this uh, moment. Uh, this is something that we might want to reconsider in the future, though. Can I, uh, can yes. I interrupt with a question. Um, we we kind of um, been thinking a bit about um, second access points in Thessaloniki because uh, potentially the the subscription. The cost of connectivity is cheaper. Um, so, if you're not putting a router in, though, we could we could move our Jaren router to to Thessaloniki, uh, and then uh, just uh, you could then perhaps back all. We could put a second MX in. in uh, well, uh, we keep. Uh, would that be of interest? Uh, this is exactly why we had uh, we had been thinking about uh, about this. Um, because it may it may cost you money to have an IP a pop in in Thessaloniki, but it may if the connectivity is cheaper to Thessaloniki, it may, may actually end up saving you money. Well, uh, the only thing is that uh, we have a uh, the WDM network, so uh, if we manage to get some capacity in Thessaloniki, mm. either uh, from uh, the and or from uh, some other uh, uh, from a tier one or from wh wh whatever. We can easily uh, drop it to Athens, right. so uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm still not. We're still not sure if it makes sense to set up uh, a pop there because uh, we do not have a, uh, a quality data center there, like we have in Athens. Right. Uh, we're co-located in uh, uh, OTA buildings, uh, so well it is not. It, it is not such a good option. But but th this is uh, this is something that we want to keep open. It's something we're definitely investigating. Uh, yes. We'll, we'll keep talking to you about. So, uh, finally, from the dimensioning, from the traffic analysis, we managed to figure out what would be the sizing of the current nodes and of the CP switches. And this is the topology of uh, GRNet4. You can see here the two uh, IP routers and the and the two uh, big uh, carrier nodes. So these, are, these are in two different data centers in Athens with a lot of capacity uh, uh, between them. You can see the uh, stub uh, backbone uh, uh, ring uh, at the north and at the south of the country uh, with multiple of 10 gigs. And then all the other uh, pops are connected with uh, uh, 10 gigs, 10 gig uh, links. So with regard to the IP network, we concluded that uh, uh, we would we will go with a collapsed uh, IP network. Uh, we figured out that it makes sense to uh, have a, a small number of uh, nodes with uh, advanced functionality. Uh, this would uh, reduce uh, the cost for uh, the for the rest of the network and would uh, make uh, very easy to upgrade the feature set uh, in the future by upgrading those two routers or even replacing those two routers. Uh, we, we will keep uh, these two routers in uh, Athens in two different pops for redundancy. Uh, these two routers would be identical, uh, identical in hardware, in uh, configuration setup, etc. And uh, we will try to have an active-active uh, setup. And uh, every resource, a customer, uh, the and the Internet Exchange, uh, data center, etc., will connect uh, directly or through our DWDM or uh, carrier network. Uh, to each of uh, uh, the two IP routers. <coughs> With regard to the carrier network, the basic functionality that we need from the carrier network is uh, inline and uh, inline uh, services. Uh, E3 is, uh, is also a cool feature, but I'm not sure if we have uh, a use case. Uh, anyway, uh, an important property of the carrier network is uh, traffic engineering and uh, faster route. Uh, we also feel that uh, 
we would like to be able to support some uh, basic uh, uh, QoS. But what is very important is to be able to have some uh, one functions there in order to monitor and troubleshoot uh, the, the services. Uh, also, the carrier network should be able to cooperate smoothly with our access uh, uh, network, uh, especially in terms of uh, management and, uh, and OAM. So with regard uh, to technology candidates, we had uh, uh, basically th three candidates, candidates for uh, the carrier network. That is uh, MPLSTP, PBBT, uh, and uh, Ethernet over MPLS. Uh, the, the choice of the technology had to be done in uh, quite early stage. Uh, and uh, this would have a, a very big uh, impact on, uh, on the procurement. So we had to be very uh, sure uh, that uh, we're going in the, in the right direction. Uh, let me note here that uh, if we would go with a competitive uh, dialogue process, uh, this would, uh, would allow us to postpone the decision to a later phase. However, our uh, management and legal department decided not to go, uh, not to use this tool, so the decision had to be taken at an early stage. So in order to make sure that uh, we're on the right path, uh, uh, we, took, uh, we participated in conferences, we discussed a lot with, uh, uh, with the colleagues from uh, the ASEAN community. Actually, we participated in a small uh, Ethernet architecture workshop with the Nodernet and Surfernet. We had a lot of discussion with ASEAN. Uh, uh, we discussed a lot with uh, PSNC and uh, other NRNs. Of course, we had a lot of discussions with, uh, with vendors. Uh, we tried to evaluate as much as possible in our, in our, in our own uh, labs. And of course, uh, we did a lot of uh, studying. So after uh, a quite uh, big uh, evaluation period, we decided that uh, the most appropriate uh, solution uh, technology for us would be Ethernet over MPLS. Uh, there are some advantages uh, of this solution. First of all, we are already familiar with this uh, uh, technology. There is a small uh, learning curve for, for us. There are no, we feel that there are no risks there. Uh, there is an easy upgrade path from our existing network. And Xeant uh, and many NRNs uh, uh, have already gone or are going to the same uh, direction. With regard to MPLSTP, we thought that um, uh, we felt that it was uh, too early to ride this train. Uh, the vendors were speaking about it a lot, but we didn't seem, uh, but the, there didn't seem to be a lot of um, mature products uh, uh, on the market uh, yet. So we thought that uh, there was be there was a uh, quite big uh, risk there. Uh, with a very bit T, the vendor support was very poor, and um, we felt that uh, this technology was uh, somehow abandoned. Um, and we're not convinced that it would uh, fit our needs. Okay, I can skip this. Another decision uh, of the design team was uh, uh, to go with a single NMS that will manage uh, our entire network. Uh, this uh, would uh, facilitate, uh, facili uh, make, make easier our day-to-day -day management uh, and operations, and uh, especially uh, the provisioning of uh, airline and airline services and uh, traffic engineering. Uh, the NMS should have a web interface and, and uh, an earthbound API. This would allow us uh, to give uh, uh, a view to a view of this NMS to our customers and uh, probably redirect some of uh, their requests uh, uh, there. And uh, also it would allow us to integrate with uh, provisioning uh, tools uh, such as uh, bandwidth on demand. And also it will allow us to do some data mining and integrate with other uh, um, applications that we run, uh, for example, monitoring. Um, finally, uh, we put a lot of effort uh, in uh, ensuring that uh, the equipment that we will receive uh, is as uh, uniform as, uh, as possible. We decided to go with a single vendor for uh, uh, the entire um, uh, for all uh, all the three types of equipment, uh, IP, carrier, and uh, access. Uh, this will this will uh, 
this was done in order to ensure that uh, we'll have a good uh, uh, interoperability between the uh, current access uh, layers, especially with regard to ARM, and uh, a better integration with the, the NMS of the vendor. Uh, since we decided to go with single vendor, we decided to keep the same platform for uh, IP and uh, carrier networks. And uh, we decided to give uh, extra credits to the vendors that would uh, provide a single, uh, any kind of uniformity, uh, single, uh, single OS across uh, all platforms, same SDK, etc. And uh, also we even tried to minimize the different type of uh, optic uh, interface that we would uh, use. SFP plus or XFPs, so we we'll don't have to maintain um, too many different uh, types of uh, hardware. This is the bill of material uh, for our uh, upgrade. <coughs> and uh, with regard to the procurement, the budget uh, was uh, 2.6 million euros. Uh, this uh, budget was uh, all inclusive, so we asked uh, for all uh, all license and all uh, features that we might uh, need in the future, uh, plus uh, five years of, uh, of support. Uh, the GPL price for the equipment was uh, more or less about 25 million uh, euros. Uh, sorry, this is dollars, 25 million dollars. Uh, and the, the rate between the euro and dollar was a big uh, headache for us because we were trying to figure out if uh, if uh, the vendors would fit uh, this small uh, budget. But uh, apparently they did because we had uh, three different offers, one from uh, one with Juniper and uh, two with uh, Cisco. So the current status, uh, the RFP was aired in uh, August 1st. Uh, the closing date was uh, September 25. As I told you, we have uh, three, three offers in our hands and we're about to finish the technical uh, evaluation. So hopefully by the first or second quarter of 2013, we, we will have uh, roll out our uh, new network. Uh, a small note here, uh, the optical network procurement uh, will follow. So, uh, although we will have our IP network, uh, we will not be able to implement the full uh, topology uh, until we also have our, DW, uh, our uh, DWDM network uh, upgraded. Basically, many of the 10 gig uh, links, backbone links, will be 1 gig. So this is it, more or less. Any questions? Okay. Questions? We already asked your questions that you asked. Yes. Okay. Are, are you, with regards to all this UD stuff, are you planning to make that available? Uh, Generally, in all the hops, like like you just saw for the Shan network yesterday, I guess from Shelly, that you know, basically, Sorry, uh, UD is going to be available to all inmates connected to the to the NMXs. Sorry, what is the question again? So, so depending on the month. Ah, yes, yes, yes. You look at that, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Operator, the Shan network, well, we plan we plan to do so. We plan to follow the same approach as uh, the hand. Yeah. So we'll. Uh, we plan to use uh, our NMS. Uh, there's a good chance that uh, it will be. I mean, uh, as I told you, the vendors is Juniper and Cisco. Yeah. Uh, if we go with Juniper, we'll have the same uh, NMS as the Ant, so we'll uh, follow exactly the same uh, uh, the same path. If we go with uh, Cisco, the idea will be the same. So, uh, uh, in any case, we we plan to give uh, the service uh, to all uh, to all our network. Yeah. Budget 2.5 million, is that including everything, but optical layer 2? Uh, this is the bill of materials, okay, of course, there's not much detail here. Uh, this includes uh, all the carrier uh, routers uh, with, um, uh, it is um, uh, a number of uh, 10 gigabit ports uh, uh, on, each, uh, on each category, I, uh, I think it is uh, six, uh, six, twenty-four, and uh, this is twelve, I think. I think a bit ports. Uh, the IP router has uh, again uh, twenty-four, uh, ten gigabit ports. Uh, 
we have some CPUs, uh, these are uh, equipped with uh, 2 by 10 gigabit, a uh, few number of data center fields, and then a mesh. Uh, not all, not all, uh, not all, all the XFPs or XFP Plus for uh, for these ports will be there, though. Uh, we we reduced the number a little bit because we figured out that it would be very hard. Uh, actually, the vendors, the the integrators, uh, had a very hard. They told us that they had a very hard time in fitting uh, into this budget. So <laughs> uh, we reduced a little bit the number of, uh, of uh, optic interfaces. By the way, uh, here I mentioned one MS, but uh, actually we ask for uh, also a demo license, uh, a lab, uh, a lab license. So basically, these two licenses, two different licenses, because we want uh, another one for uh, experimentation. How does the MS from Cisco and Junior Bus also compare? If you look at those, I mean, what's the differences, if, if, if any? Well. Um, It was very, it was very hard to compare uh, because these are two very different software products. Uh, my my impression was that um, uh, the Cisco NMS, which is Cisco Prime, is um, is a result of um, uh, of the merging of a few different tools. Uh, I have the impression that uh, Juno Space is uh, um, is better as a as a tool. Uh, but it was very very hard to compare. So we had uh, we set up uh, a number of requirements. Uh, both uh, both of the both both of uh, the NMSs um, succeeded uh, uh, in meeting those uh, requirements. Um, you know, it is very it is very hard to evaluate a piece of software unless you have actually uh, worked with it. I mean, the PDF everything seems uh, great. Yeah. So I don't know. Probably some someone who has some experience with Cisco Prime uh, or with Juno Space could uh, could comment mm -hmm. about their maturity and. Uh, I guess as part of the, of, of the procurement of, of, of the Xiao network, you know, there must have been some kind of ev evaluation of, of these two products. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether there's anybody in the room who knows more about it. Maybe we discuss that for what. Yes, we had we had some discussions with this, with Zand uh, about this, and we had some feedback. Our impression is that uh, Juno Space might be a little bit better than, uh, but uh, we cannot, we can, you cannot say unless you try it. Okay. And uh, at the end, at that point, uh, was uh, also the procurement phase, so they didn't actually, they hadn't uh, bought it and tried already. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and Victor comes again, talking about the uh, HN at Backbone Network mm -hmm. this time. Uh, yeah, it's about, uh, it's not about call for tender, as I was heard. <laughs> We don't, uh, as was stated in the in the program, uh, because that is uh, some other work that's not important uh, for what I wanted to say. Uh, I want to say, uh, yeah, we are going to 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 do a new uh, optical uh, backbone. We have an old uh, optical backbone. I think everybody already heard the reasons why you have to upgrade. Ours is also the, the end of life of, of equipment, and uh, so we have to replace it. And um, there are many reasons why you replace it. Uh, if we looked at the bandwidth needs in our network, we wouldn't need to replace the backbone until 2014. Uh, there was, of course, the reason that the end of life is also in 2014, so there is that reason. And the other reason might be that, that people want more services. And one service is the, the 10 gigabit or 100 gigabit point-to-point -point links. 
but also in, in our case it was uh, optical resilience and uh, point to point and uh, pop resilience which uh, made it more important to to uh, to to change our backbone and, and 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 start changing that as soon as possible so it's 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 by by, by uh, yeah looking at all these kind of things so capacity uh, the maintenance of it and the, fu the function of it, the, the, the res res resilience needs of our users was the most important. Uh, there are three subjects that I'm going to handle. One is the past, uh, the point to points, because also people want uh, resilience for them. Uh, that's a simple one. And the other one is the, the, the whole backbone and the underlying optical infrastructure that has to be resilient, which is the second point in my talk. And the third one is the, the timelines that we are planning for this. But before going into the detail, and again, it's only about resilience that I talk, the reasons for, for the most important one. There are, we defined uh, this list of resilience types, and, and most of them are implemented, that are the, the one in black. Um, uh, so most of them are, are implemented two years ago in another project we had. We didn't do everywhere re replication of the optical equipment uh, because we, we thought that there would not be any problems because normally they are fully optical, there is almost no electronics uh, going on. That is not true everywhere and of course we had an outage of a few hours half a year ago where the optical node went down and then and a whole region went down. Pop resilience we did everywhere in principle, but uh, the pops are at our client sites, and of course clients don't like two pops on their site uh, because of power reasons, of location reasons, uh, they don't have enough uh, yeah, uh, property to put a, a pop in. So at some locations we, we didn't do a dual pop, and because of that we had also these outages. So. So you can see that, that this one is perhaps more important even than that one. Um, the other thing is power resilience. It's also important to look at that. Uh, normally we define for every pop there has to be two feeds of power and don't do them both on UPS, but do one on the UPS and one directly from the mains. But because UPS is the worst resilient uh, power in my opinion. But if you have two different sources, it would be nice if you have two different how do you call that? And uh, yeah, really different uh, from uh, different transformers and that kind of things. That would be better. But I think if you have UPS and one mains, that 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 at least helps that we can do that. Of course, uh, dark fiber everywhere. We have already had that, and they have to be pass resilient, so they have to go through different ducts. But that's normally what you already do. Uh, equipment we already did at the IP and uh, the Ethernet layer. We even told, cl or some clients have dual equipment on their side, and uh, we already had our dual equipment on their side. So, uh, and the same for the Ethernet, the point to point service. Service resilience, in, in our uh, uh, idea, is that, that if something goes down in, in, in the, let's say, the primary path, that the secondary path has the same type of service or the same bandwidth or the same functionality and so on. So that's what we define with service of uh, 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 resilience. So we try to have, if something goes down, that uh, nobody uh, sees that there is a, a problem except the not people that they have to do something. Application resilience, I should have given that a color, I think, because <laughs> It's uh, certainly now, let's say that your power goes down and your pop then goes down. And if you have there an LDAP server, which is being used by Google <coughs> email, then nobody of your students is able to go to, to Google email, which is totally outside our NRAN environment. It's in the normal internet. So, so make sure that your applications like LDAP, DNS, web uh, pages are not only on your website, but also make sure that they are resilient. So this is a, an activity the client really has to do, and 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 this could be the major issue, <coughs> yeah? because uh, and people going to the VLEs in, in Amsterdam, Blackboard, and so on, they sometimes utilize, yeah, the, the LDAP server, which is in the in in, in one location. <laughs> Provider resilience is another one that we uh, have, uh, which we don't implement, but that means that, let's say that, beside a chain of providing IP services, we could, by definition, say that another provider has to provide an IP service to, to an institute. So, you have two 
different IP providers going into the institute and that ha has a better uh, uh, level of resilience because you have different equipment, different management entities, more costs uh, and that kind of things. And we, we didn't choose for that because we think that by doing most of the other ones that you can solve the problems. Uh, uh but th that could be that there is an operating system problem, let's say that all the Cisco's or all the Junipers go down because of, uh, of software work. And, and if you have provider resilience, you would overcome that. But we didn't invest in that at this moment, and we're not going to do that, by the way. But all the others is, is, uh, has to be done. Uh, so it, it's resilience, make sure that if you talk about resilience, that you don't use the word resilience. But make sure that you talk about all these kind of things because they determine the service at the end. Yeah? And you have to have a plan to look at that. Uh, and if paths of circuits change, make sure that the paths are still diverse. Yeah? So on, and the same for, for power and equipment. So that's what resilience is. Um, it's, a, it's a big concept and uh, don't, 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 don't think it's easy. It's, it's a lot of work and costs money. So point-to-point -point circuits, in our case, are, are um, in some way easy to provide our our point-to-point -point service, uh, which we, we provide through our provisioning system, is in some way is at that level fully resilient. We have everywhere dual Ethernet switches uh, and, and so on. So, so that service is resilient. The only problem is that if, if a client uses that service, there is sometimes only one fiber going to that client. Let's say if it is a, an outreach center or a, a department or a campus, normally there is only one link to going to that campus. Now, clients now want to have uh, uh, resilience uh, because of the, the importance of the internet there and going to these blackboards and the Googles and, uh, the and so on outside the network and not si inside the, the, the institute anymore. So people now want to have two paths going uh, between uh, institutes or departments of institutes and that's why we are going to provide uh, a path resilient uh, point to point. There's not another layer which is important in this case because we only provide a point to point link and, uh, and the rest is, uh, is, is done. So this is what the normal situation, this is the main site uh, and then there are these campuses uh, and they only have one point to point and that's a non-resilient point to point as we call them. Of course the campus is, is always dual connected to HNS by definition. Uh, that's, that's how we started our network. Uh, and we are now going to, to, when clients ask for it, we are going to see if we can make another path. You have to remember of course that that second path will always be more expensive than the green path because you already did a call for tender to get a green path uh, fiber. So if you need another path, it, it can be uh, two or three times more expensive uh, due to all kinds of reasons because it has to be a different path. So. so there is a negotiation to be done with the client to determine if the cost uh, will um, yeah, satisfy the, the needs. Uh, so that's why we have around uh, the, the path resilient point to point a process where we first are going to identify or which client wants to have that service that's step one they have to come to us and saying we find it important and then we are going to ask them why do you find it important yeah are there major services at that location are there so many students there yeah don't do it only for two students but it has to be a, a, a good site otherwise it's a waste of money and of course, so that's determining the importance on the on the, the client side. But then we have to determine what the costs are, and uh, of course, you have to go to the market. You have to ask the cost and, and all that kind of stuff. It's a simple process in some way. Uh, you just decide at a certain moment: yes, we do it or we don't do it. And these are the things that we are will look at. Um, so it's it's yeah. How I is the importance of such a, a, sec a secondary link? Uh, will it impact the students? research activities and what are the effects of these interruptions uh, on it is it is it about money or is it about uh, okay. yeah the, the status of an institute or the status of a department that they really want to be 100% connected and so on um, 
And of course, there is also not only research and education, but also the payroll and uh, and, and other things are, are nowadays done over over HANet, and they normally also go outside HANet you know, to to the HPs and and then the Microsoft and so on. So, so also there you have to to see how important it is uh, for that resilience. So that's the point to point. Quite simple. We can do it with our present network. We, we don't have to invest money, except if somebody asks for a link, we just buy that link and uh, and it, it's almost done yeah so that's that's a simple one and it uses more or less existing procedures if we want to provide it on the national backbone where we had a problem that there was only one optical switch at one location you can imagine that we have to do quite a lot there uh, one of the first things is that in the national backbone so that's our figure of eight in a network we have to replace our equipment because it's out of life and that was the advice that we got from uh, an external company that we uh, asked for advice because it cost them a lot of money. So we thought, let's help get an external company in. So for the national backbone, we say we do a replacement in Dublin, which is a, has a, metro, a, poly, you know, a small network. And uh, that equipment is not that old and uh, that are DWM switches of Adva and uh, we assume that we can just uh, do an upgrade there of the equipment so we don't have to do a call for tender, it's just upgrading, adding a few optical nodes uh, in, in the ring. So this is what is meant with uh, the enhanced network resilience. Because we did already all the other ones, yeah, the power of the power, the, the most of the pops are, are already there. But the optical equipment is at one location. So we are going to uh, duplicate that optical equipment and, uh, and make sure that the links, of course, get that to these duplicated uh, locations. So it's in some ways, it's a, a simple process. The only thing is it needs new equipment. <laughs> and for that, we have to do a call for tender. Uh, there are many ways of doing such a, a, a network and uh, there are here w w again we ask an external company to help us to decide what the best way f is forward to invest a few million into a new backbone so we asked an external company to do that and they came up with options of what to do and uh, I, I'm not going to into detail what these options are but let's say there were six options I think from doing nothing to replacing everything and of course uh, there, there are differences in cost there and so on but we don't have to go into detail now they evaluated more or less what were the obvious ones that we shouldn't do and that made a smaller list and in some way that the list that came out of it was more or less checking okay we can uh, replace our national backbone as I already said or uh, or we can do it with new equipment uh, putting it in the in the same network and but this was their first uh, evaluation so there were three options these three options went through another middle of processes where we looked at at really the more the technology the, the costing uh, what fall over cap capabilities were there the stability and support and, and and what it would be to to move from the existing network to the new network so it was a little bit more a technical evaluation and that uh, came to two uh, uh, or one solution for the national backbone uh, where the two options uh, two obvious options were there they were rated and weighted and more or less like a call for for, for tender process and option B was chosen which was in this case replacing our existing equipment it almost costed not that much more money to to have a, a fully optical resilient network uh, there so and for the Dublin core ring, it was a little bit different because we had good equipment. It was only adding three new boxes. Uh, in principle, they cost still money, of course, but uh, and that's option uh, also option B for for that uh, solution. So, so I think the most important of of this is that we asked an external company to do this for us, <laughs> just to give us a weight to go to the board of directors of HANet and saying. These are the ideas. Somebody looked at the ideas. Do you support our change in the network? I think we could have come up with the same options and solutions, but we asked an external company to do that. So, yeah, these are a little bit the business case evaluation of why are you going to invest that money in, 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 in such a change? Because it costs you money 
because you need dual optical equipment and operational procedures have to change some some other things uh, like ma operational management has to to opt and opt and so on so so it, it was evaluated also in in uh, in the sense of almost doing nothing which is uh, the d1 to the one that we have chosen and it's of course nice to see everywhere green where it means that that what we choose was the best choice uh, for for doing it but it gives at least protection to a single location failure um, it gives uh, around um, the uh, an availability of a system due to maintenance uh, there is a uh, yeah it reduces the the, the, the critical times uh, of the academic year that we can uh, overcome that it complements what the, the campuses or the institutes have to do on disaster recovery because they have now also demand to make sure that they are not disconnected from the strategically important internet uh, and most of our institutes have such policies and strategies that they, they, they need that and it, it will enable this natural backbone will enable these new point to points that we can indeed provide better and easier the the, the resilient point to point links There are some fluffier ones uh, of, of a business case because you can't, uh, it's, uh, even if, if a school only gets, uh, let's say if a lecture stops for an hour or uh, it will be postponed, what are the costs for that? It's very difficult to calculate the cost of one hour not being able to lecture. Uh, in some way we were lucky that one site had an hour outage, but the, even they were not very uh, capable of getting up the cost of, of, of such an outage of um, of, um, of, of their primary uh, business uh. but yeah it, it's about reputation I think that's what the most things are people people want to see that the reputation is not damaged by an outage and they are willing to pay for that in some way we calculated what the costs are for yeah comparing a network as if we have it now and when they're fully resilient uh, we do that for 27 clients the cost per client per year is around 5,000 euros for having an optical resilient network plus all the other resilient so it's not that that much 5k per year is is, is, is a small number I think compared to, to the rest of the cost that you have in the network so luckily there are lots of clients that do it so it's, 20, it's 27 times 5 so you, you earn some money due to that so yeah, these are the recommendations of uh, analysis Mason, who did a report. Uh, but it's it's more or less what what what, what I said. Uh, so the the national backbone uh, is end of life. So replace it, uh, uh, and and uh, make sure that other uh, 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 what is it uh, the the other requirements uh, will be uh, made sure because clients want to have that uh, resilience also at other locations. The Dublin core ring is simpler it's sometimes it's splitting the equipment or it's buying some equipment uh, to make sure that it happens to do this it's very important that, that the client cooperates because we need two pops and they have to be of high standard and um, so you have to make sure that they provide what the what the end brand wants and I think the most important that we learned from the earlier service resilience uh, project is that we were oh, okay now if you can't do that then it's okay yeah oh you can't do power resilience oh, okay we, it's okay and you don't and we didn't write it down no emails but of course at some moment there is a power outage and then the client will always blame the NRAN well in some way we said to them we want to have power resilience uh, we don't have it on paper so it's good to I, I think for this we, that's what we learned we this has to be paper based <laughs> we want to have a paper track where people saying yes we can provide a pop if we can't provide it then you will lose some type of uh, resilience for your institute yeah. and it's that paper uh, trail that that will cost also time and uh, and effort I think these are the timelines of the projects. So we didn't start the, the call for tender yet. We are talking with providers and uh, equipment providers and so on in doing it. And uh, at the end of the projects, which is uh, the green phases, that's the commissioning one, we will have a sweep up or a clean up of our, all our clients to see if the resilience is, is, is as uh, agreed. 
and that will take some time because some clients will be way later because uh, yeah we have mm -hmm. to get perhaps an, another link or something like that in, in place so uh, but yeah we, we do the the two things differently the national backbone needs a call for tender and the other one the, the Dublin coring is is a small network and there we already have equipment so that that's an, a faster process we hope although it's more difficult to be honest in, uh, in ma management of the project So these are the, um, the advantages. Uh, so what we provide is uh, more resilience. I don't have the number of nines to be honest, uh, but uh, at this moment we provide nine nines towards our clients. I hope that we can add another nine, uh, but remember that, that the number of nines uh, that the equipment can do or that the actual service is normally better than what you promise to your clients, of course. So um, <coughs> I, I, we haven't decided yet the number of nines to our clients, but uh, we'll see. I think that the I think I, I see more NRANs going to, to this idea dual pops, uh, dual equipment uh, and so on. I think Surfnet uh, is also looking at that, that idea now so and I heard in the presentations also at least par parts of that so I think uh, it's become so important the IP without it yeah these people can't do any work anymore because most of the services are outside the Institute you have to reach them through the Institute so it, it, is, it is essential importance. Luckily by replacing it we can go to 100 gigabit because we will define that at least. I'm not saying that we need it. I don't think that we need it in Ireland for the coming five years, but you never know. I'm not looking at 400 gig. Mm. So I don't think that that will be needed in, in Ireland, but, um, but we will foresee 100 gigabit somewhere, perhaps at the end of the, or in four or five years or something like that, that, that somebody will ask for it. And I think the somebody that will ask for it will be our own service people. So our own services might need 100 gigabit, let's say for, uh, for fast storage or uh, cloud servers or whatever. We see it important uh, for, for merging clients. Uh, I don't know if that's in your countries, but in Ireland at least, uh, all the universities, or I shouldn't say that, but some universities are and, and institutes of technology have to merge because of the economic climate. Uh, if these merges, then administratively they become one institute, but network-wise is still needed, but the, the, the chance is that they will need thicker pipes between themselves to make sure that everything works so that's why we can provide them multiple 10 gigabits to make sure that these disparate uh, new uh, clients can still work as if it is uh, as if they are different or if they are one depending on what they want but uh, but th that is yeah the government has has declared that it has to happen so and we see new services uh, coming up we have now an edge storage uh, service in HANet where uh, where we provide an SQZ uh, interface towards our clients and where we have some 20 gigabyte or what is it tera or petabyte lots of bytes and uh, and clients are now utilizing that for their own administration and we see traffics of 200 or 400 megabit constantly for transferring data between their own sites and and uh, let's say the central uh, storage site so um, it, it, we don't know e exactly when it ends. It might be that, that, that 10 gigabit will be needed fast because of this change of services. And of course, these stories don't have to be in HN, they could be also outside <coughs> the network. And then also then uh, for that, we want to make perhaps direct peerings to the Googles or the Amazons in, in Ireland. What the program is not about, and I think it's always good to mention that, perhaps not for here, but certainly for the clients, is it's not about upgrading clients uh, in IP and point-to-point. -point. We do that in a separate track. When they need it, when they need more traffic, or want to, when they need to transport more traffic, they get an upgraded link. They don't get just automatically an upgraded link. We don't do that anymore. So there are normal procedures to, to handle that. So that's that are the reasons that we utilize to our board, and uh, mm. in some way the board of directors agreed with this project. So we're now implementing this with the hope to have it at the end of 2014. So it's really around resilience. Uh, that that's the reason why we are going to upgrade. Nothing. More. That's it. If you have questions.
uh, just uh, one thing about the power objects is, um, I think uh, <coughs> that is a concern for everybody, but usually when you have a power outage, it's, it's maybe your transmission equipment goes down, but the customer's equipment goes down as well. So in, in the case of the site redundancy, I would say it's, I think we're thinking more about having protection for double faults or something like that, or else we install a diesel generator instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in some way, that's also what we proposed in the first era, uh, that we even paid for generators and that kind of things, or UPSs and so on. But it is not, I'm not that concerned about the local side, what happens there. If they go out because of their power loss, I don't care that much. It's more that other sites, uh, other clients, are not affected by it. And by having another pop, uh, we will we'll, uh, guarantee at least that they can continue. Yeah. So it's I'm not concerned if, if 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 somebody one client does something wrong. No. It's their problem. Yeah. But at least I don't want to have other clients having it, it, it's it's a, I think that the service would only <coughs> perhaps once a year or less to be utilized, I think. Yeah. So the five K per per site yeah, per year is for that once for the whole community, I think. Yeah. So it's really about yeah, uh, uh, how, how do how, how are the, the, the institutes perceived uh, from their students and the clients and the peers and the external money flows and so on? Okay, other questions? If not, and thank okay. you very much, Victor. Okay. So, and the further plan is that we're going to have a coffee break now. And after the coffee break, we can have a panel discussions going to be chaired by Lars Fischer.